All right, we'll call this hearing to order. This afternoon, we welcome Administrator Pete Neffinger to testify on the Transportation Security Administration's fiscal year 2017 budget request. Welcome, I'm glad you're here. Administrator, thanks for all you do, and we're, we're very pleased we have to be able to do this hearing today. The FY17 budget for TSA is $7.6 billion, which is $149 million above FY16. This year's budget is a significant departure from previous years, which were marked by reductions in screening personnel and other efficiencies achieved through TSA's risk-based security initiatives. This committee has long supported risk-based approaches to transportation security, but has emphasized the need for these programs to be grounded in, in improving security above all else. <clears throat> the FY17 budget request uh, continues initiatives funded in FY16 to strengthen passenger screening operations, equipment, training, and intelligence and vetting programs. In response to the disturbing results from the OIG's Office of Testing last year. I look forward to hearing from you on the progress TSA has made so far and how, F how FY17 budget continues to support these efforts. I would also like to understand how TSA is continuing to invest in risk-based security efforts that will ensure we are focusing our resources on the highest risk passengers. Lastly, I would be remiss not to convey my disappointment that the administration has yet again resorted to budget gimmicks, assuming unauthorized fees as an offset for TSA's appropriations. This has a, created a huge hole in TSA's budget to the tune of about $908.8 million that Congress now has to deal with. I'd like to recognize our distinguished ranking member of the whole committee, Ms. Lowy, for any remarks that you would like to make. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your very gracious welcome. It's always a pleasure for me to be here with you and our ranking member, Lord Bell Allard. I thank you for holding this hearing today. And Am Administrator Neffinger, I welcome you and thank you for joining us. The President's budget proposes $7.33 billion for the TSA, which is a modest $149 million increase from fiscal year 2016. The request includes investments to enhance aviation security and continue risk-based security initiatives, such as TSA PreCheck. TSA has shown a commitment to maximizing security capabilities while expediting the screening process for low-risk travelers. Last year's OIG report on vulnerabilities in TSA's screening process was a reminder, however, that we must take great care in ensuring that security remains the top priority. Our aviation security infrastructure remains at risk due to poor screening standards of airport employees and significant vulnerabilities to perimeter security. In particular, I'm disturbed by reports of security gaps around airport perimeters and at non-passenger access points, which could be exploited by attackers to sneak bombs onto planes, much like what happened at the Sharm El Sheikh Airport last year. I look forward to hearing from you on what improvements TSA is making to protect the traveling public. In addition to combat risk to aviation security, we need a trained and experienced workforce to deter and detect security threats. I work with your predecessor and Administrator Pistol to ensure that transportation security offices have satisfactory workplace rights and responsibilities. As I think you can agree, TSOs put themselves on the line every day to protect us and deserve an enriching professional environment. That's why I'm concerned about morale and collective bargaining for TSA employees, and more specifically, career advancement and workplace discrimination for female 
TSOs. Administrator Neffinger, you have a lot on your plate. I look forward to discussing these concerns today and hearing your testimony. Thank you, Ms. Louie. We're honored to have you here, and I know you've got plenty of missions that you've got to accomplish today. We're, th we th we're thankful for you. Uh, Ms. Robel Allard. Administrator uh, Neffinger, welcome to your first appearance before uh, our subcommittee. Uh, you arrived on the scene just when significant changes were needed in TSA screening uh, operations. The results of the Office of Inspector General's covert testing found that TSA had been moving too fast on expedited screening without fully understanding a number of the risks and vulnerabilities. Because the vulnerabilities identified by the OIG were not really new, the OIG report raised questions about TSA's ability to manage competing pressures of prioritizing security and reducing wait times. Over the last several months, TSA has taken a number of steps to address many of the vulnerabilities. <coughs> there is one area of improvement in particular on which I want to commend you and your workforce. I, I am a frequent traveler between DC and my home district in Los Angeles. And I actually have seen a difference in the degree of professionalism that has been di displayed by many of, of your uh, officers. And I hope that my colleagues and members of the traveling uh, public have also experienced the same thing. Uh, I look forward to this afternoon's discussion of TSA's proposed budget for the coming year and um, look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Ms. Rowe, we're ready to hear from you, and we, we've got your written statement in the, in the file, and of course, we're all aware of it, so you may proceed. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Carter, Ranking Member Roybal Allard, Ranking Member Lowy, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, and thanks for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the fiscal year 2017 budget, which includes $7.6 billion for TSA. I thank you also for the support that, that this committee had provided to TSA uh, in the omnibus bill of 2016. Uh, that was, a, I think, an important uh, step forward in terms of addressing some of the challenges last year. Uh, this budget provides funding to sustain and strengthen the critical missions of TSA, protecting the nation's transportation system and ensuring the freedom of movement of people and commerce. Transportation underpins the entire economic health of this country. We depend upon it and protecting it is one of the most important services our government provides the American people. It is now eight months since I joined TSA on July 4th of last year, and of the many positive impressions, the most profound is the one I've gleaned about our workforce. TSA's nearly 60,000 security professionals are dedicated to a demanding and challenging mission, and they are our most important resource. They are incredibly patriotic and passionate about our counterterrorism mission, and will deliver excellence if properly trained, equipped, and led. This budget is a modest increase over last year and will enable TSA to more fully renew its focus on security effectiveness. It annualizes the investments made in our frontline workforce, our screening technology, and the new TSA Academy, and sets the foundation for the transformation of TSA into the professional counterterrorism and security agency the American people deserve. I'd like to thank this subcommittee for its commitment to our mission and for helping us hold frontline staffing levels steady in the face of dramatic increases in passenger volume in a dynamic threat environment. This budget also enables us to hire air marshals for the first time since 2011, consistent with a risk-based concept of operations, and modestly increases our intelligence capability and invests further in the TSA Academy. We've made great strides in addressing the challenges we faced last summer. To ensure we do not repeat past mistakes, determining root causes of the problems identified has been my utmost concern. Delivered in a classified report to Congress and this committee in January, we concluded that strong drivers of the problem included a disproportionate focus on efficiency, environmental influences that created stress in checkpoint operations, and gaps in system design and processes. I'm proud to report that we have refocused on our primary mission, retrained our entire workforce, corrected procedures, improved our technology, and analyzed systemic issues. We are emphasizing the values of discipline, competence, and professionalism in resolving every alarm, and I'm confident that we have corrected the immediate problems I'm also confident that TSA is able to deter, detect, and disrupt threats to our aviation system. TSA will continue to partner with the airlines, the airport operators, and the trade and travel industry to identify solutions that can reduce stress on the checkpoint, particularly as we move into the summer season, 
and we must continue to right size and resource TSA appropriately to ensure that we continue to be responsive to the public we serve. Moving forward, we're guided by a principled approach central to a successful enterprise leadership. We are intensely, intensely focusing on the central unifying purpose of TSA, which is to deliver transportation security. And we are aligning our that we expect is memorialized in my administrator's intent. This is a document I published in January this year. I provided copies to the subcommittee. Mission success is built on a shared understanding of objectives, unity of purpose, and alignment of values and principles. And my intent articulates those objectives for the entire organization. The approach we will pursue in accomplishing our essential counterterrorism mission and the values and principles that define us. Simply stated, we will focus on mission, invest in our people, and commit to excellence. Our self-examination also gave us insight into imperatives for change and how we must evolve. We must adapt faster than the enemy. We must invest at the pace of the threat. We must build resiliency into operations, and we must do so in a rapidly growing sector of the American economy. We are undertaking a series of foundational efforts, including a comprehensive assessment of our acquisition system, building a planning, programming, budgeting, and execution system, developing an enterprise-wide human capital management strategy, reviewing our staffing model to ensure operational focus and agility, and fielding an agency-wide training strategy, which includes new officer training, continuing professional education, and leadership training and development. We are rethinking how we invest in technology and are partnering with several airlines and airports to develop and install in the near future a dramatically improved passenger screening environment in a couple of key airports. Of utmost importance, TSA must remain committed to the values that public service demands. And I have challenged our leaders at every level to commit themselves to selfless and ethical service. As I discover questionable policies or unjustifiable practices, I fix them. I demand an agency that is values-based and infused with character from top to bottom. This is my solemn duty, and it is what the American people expect of their government and those in whom they entrust their security. Many profound and important tasks lay ahead for TSA, but I believe we are on a sound trajectory, and I'm optimistic about the future. As I have relayed in my intent, we will focus on mission, invest in our dedicated workforce, and will commit to excellence in all that we do. I thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Admiral. Before we begin, I'm going to start off with a little humor. Um, on my way up here for your hearing from, from Austin, Texas, uh, standing in the pre-check line, and I handed the uh, officer what I thought was my Texas driver's license, but it was actually my concealed carry permit, <laughs> which is, by the way, and I told him, I said, that is an official ID for the state of Texas. But I found out also that I didn't have my driver's license. He was in a dilemma because I think I threw him off with that concealed carry permit. And so I uh, got my voting card and gave it, that to him. And that impressed him even less than the concealed carry <laughs> permit. And so he went to the management to, to see if they were going to let me in. And meanwhile, half of the constituents in my district walked past me in the line <laughs> saying, what did you do? And I said, I, I don't know. And uh, they finally very graciously let me through without any problems. But I have to go back uh, tomorrow, and I might need a note from you before you leave <laughs> giving me permission. Yeah, yeah, I'll write it while we sit here, Judge. Right. <laughs> no, they were very courteous. They did a good job, and I told them that you did a good job. Thank you. Um, well, let's start off with. Uh, in FY16, Congress provided TSA with funding for, to strengthen aviation security in light of the disturbing, I'm sorry, oh, in, in light of the disturbing results from the OIG. Uh, in the past eight months, and I've, I've actually been very impressed with the, with the work that the agency has done to, uh, to correct both the immediate problems uh, raised by the uh, leaked report of the Inspector General, as well as uh, to identify systemic problems. Uh, so this budget really invests in, in, a, in, there's a people piece, a technology piece, and a training piece associated with this. The, the people piece is really the, uh, was the ability to halt further reduction of the screening workforce uh, so that we were, as you remember, originally scheduled to uh, take another 1,600 or so um, uh, bodies out of the screening workforce in FY16. And this committee and, and, and Congress uh, allowed us to keep those. I thought that was important given the, the challenges that we came across and the fact that we were going to be pushing people that had been inappropriately moved into expedited screening back into the standard lane. So I knew we'd probably need that staff 
Uh, I owe you um, an explanation of what our staffing needs are, and we're working on that right now. Uh, so that's one piece of it, is to, is to keep those people on board. Uh, the technology piece is to implement uh, some software upgrades as well as some hardware changes to the, some of the screening equipment that's in the system. So the other thing that we found is that we needed to, we needed to address the screening effect or the effectiveness of that advanced imaging machine. This is the, the one that, um, that looks for non-metallic threats. It's a good machine. It's probably the best there is out there right now for determining non-metallics. But we found through our root cause analysis that, uh, that we needed to, to tighten up the uh, standards and to improve the ability to detect in certain regions of the body. So we've done that and we're fielding uh, a new software algorithm that uh, has dramatically improved our ability to do that. Uh, the other thing we did was to, uh, one thing I was surprised to discover when I came on board is that there was no centralized and consistent oversight of training of our new hires coming in, particularly the frontline screening force. So if you joined TSA as a transportation security officer, you trained largely at the airport that you were going to work. You might, you, if you were at a smaller airport, they might port you over to the, the, the near, nearest closest airport. But it was done in, in, in what I would consider to be an inconsistent manner and, and without any uh, good means of measuring the effectiveness. And it also wasn't done real world scenario based uh, on the equipment that they would be using in the actual environment. So long story short, and, and I, I know we've presented to, uh, to the committee earlier on this, we, create, we started from scratch uh, with, your, with your funding. We created a TSA Academy at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe, Georgia, uh, a world-class training facility where some other 90 agencies uh, train their officers. Uh, they, they're an accredited facility. They helped us to build an accredit, uh, a program that we are working to get accredited. But it is a basic training course, two weeks long right now, where they start with acculturation first and foremost. What is this you're connected to? What does it mean to be part of a federal security uh, program? And how, what does it mean to be engaged in something larger than you? So I really want them to get connected to this sense of public service and the history of the organization. And then they go through Classroom laboratory immediately, or classroom work immediately followed by a laboratory where they work on the actual equipment that they're going to be using, and we can create all sorts of scenarios in that environment, and then we move them through. They actually, they go out to a bomb range, and they, they, they learn what the devices look like that they're trying to discover. They watch what happens when those devices explode, so it gives them a visceral connection to the, the work that they're doing. So I'm very excited about that, and I think that that's going to be foundational in terms of transforming the agency in the future. Uh, the other thing that we did is, uh, we, was, go uh, look deep into the organization for systemic issues. I was, I was concerned that if, we, if all we did was fix the last failures, then all we did was fix, fix the last failures. It seems to me that if you've repeatedly seen things happen, there's something more going on. And no surprise, as you looked at it, we saw systemic issues across the agency. No one person at fault, uh, but, but, uh, but an agency focus. Uh, that, and some of it is just the, 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 the tyranny of being in an operating agency that has to do something every day. You tend to do the next thing that comes along, uh, without, and sooner or later the next thing became the last thing, and it becomes the last thing over and over. So I said, you gotta take a, you gotta step back and look at the big picture. Uh, so that showed us that we had a disproportionate focus on efficiency over effectiveness. Uh, that might be the right thing to think about if you're in the management. You want to keep wait times to a reasonable level, but it can, it can get translated in distorted ways when, the, when it gets to the front line. Uh, we had um, uh, leadership, we had integration issues. You know, you have lots of things going on in the organization, but they're not tied together very effectively. And then you have uh, lots of environmental pressures, growth in passenger volume, lots more stuff coming through the checkpoint. All of that has to be considered as a system. Otherwise, you're just going to be swatting the next bad thing that happened. So I'm proud to report that I think that we've done uh, a, a good job of, of addressing those immediate challenges. Uh, our own internal testing shows that we're significantly more effective than we were uh, this time last year. Uh, I'm working with the Inspector General on the next round of testing that he intends to do. Uh, I want it to be aggressive. I want it to, be to, I want it to test the things that we've done in addition to testing other aspects of the system. And, uh, and I'm convinced that we'll do significantly better. We're going to continue to, to do that improvement as we go forward. Very good. Thank you. Ms. Lloyd? Thank you again for your courtesy, and thank you for your service, sir. Uh, two questions regarding the training program. Um, as you probably know, I've fought uh, to provide collective bargaining rights 
to transportation security officers and ensure they have the same rights and benefits as other federal employees in the Department of Homeland Security. This is of vital importance as the initial collective bargaining agreement between TSA and its frontline workers has now expired. The expiration of the contract should not result in scaling back hard for fought worker protections. So the first question is, can you update the subcommittee on when a contract between TSA and its employees will be finalized? The second question, um, the Government Accountability Office and the Department's Office of Inspector General have issued reports over the last few years in which they found significant vulnerabilities in TSA's vet vetting of aviation workers with access to secure areas of airports. These vulnerabilities included oversight of how airports collect data on applicants for wedding, vetting purposes, security threat assessments that weren't based on checks against some of the government's watch list codes, and an inability to notify the employer when an employee gains a criminal record mm -hmm. after hiring. So I understand your pro uh, progress. So the first is, once they're hired, we want to make sure they get the rights of all other employees. But secondly, I'm very concerned about this whole issue, and I understand you made some progress. What are you planning? Can you be confident that your aviation worker vetting is as rigorous as it needs to be? Uh, well, thank you, um, uh, Ranking Member Lloyd, for the question. Uh, to the first question with respect to the where we stand on the collective bargaining agreement, uh, the current collective bargaining agreement remains in effect uh, while we're, while we're uh, continuing or completing negotiations on the, on the next agreement. Uh, the current status is, is we, the negotiating teams, uh, or the go negotiating team, both sides, uh, completed its negotiations in December. Uh, they have they came to agreement on the majority of the uh, of the collective bargaining items uh, that now is going out with uh, to the union membership uh, AFGE is it has a schedule for presenting that for a referendum to the union uh, members uh, we'll see how that referendum goes um, if it passes then we'll have a new collective bargaining agreement um, uh, if uh, if there's uh, a rejection of that then we'll go back into the negotiating table uh, for an additional period of time uh, and, and negotiate those items that, um, that, that, uh, that we need to. Uh, but I'm confident that we're on a good track. Uh, the, the teams worked very hard this past year. Uh, like all negotiations, there are, there are challenging components to it, but uh, I'm committed to, um, to a successful negotiation. I'm committed to carrying forward the protections that we have in place now. Uh, as I said, the current collective bargaining agreement remains in place and we abide by that going forward. With respect to the um, uh, aviation workers, this is, this is a trusted population that has badged access to uh, airport uh, environments. Uh, I, I think we've made a lot of progress this past year. Uh, I, I, as I came in, those reports were, were coming out uh, as I took over this job. And one of my first questions was, explain to me how we do this vetting. Uh, I think on the positive side, we have, they have always, all people who hold credentials, and there are about 900,000 or so aviation worker credentials. This includes uh, pilots and air crew members and the like. So, the, so it's everything from, from the people who uh, manage the baggage and the catering and the like to the, the, the vendors in the airports to the people who fly and crew the aircraft. That's about a 900,000 person population. They have always been fully vetted against the terrorist screening database. Uh, I think what you're referencing is we, there is a, there is a, a companion database to that, date, the, to the terrorist database that is a, a, a data environment of additional information. Uh, and we, TSA did not have what's called automated access to that data. We had, we could take a name and plug it in, uh, but that's very cumbersome when you're working with 900,000 names. We now have, I'm pleased to report, we, we've come to an agreement and we now have automated access. Uh, to all of those categories. So now we have full access to all of the categories, both the, the terrorist screening database as well as the, the, the data environment that feeds into that database. So that's, that's good news. Uh, the second thing we've done is we, as we always had a, a requirement to, to periodically vet all workers against criminal databases to see if they've had any recent arrests. That was a, that's a two-year recurrent uh, requirement, periodic requirement. Uh, we're about to pilot a project with the FBI called Ratback, and, and all it really is is access to their to their daily 
for current data um, on criminal arrests throughout the system. We're going to pilot that at um, uh, Dallas-Fort Worth and Boston-Logan uh, over the course of the spring. Uh, assuming that pilot goes well, and, and the nature of the pilot is just to see are there any problems connecting to the database, do we have any problems bouncing names off of it and so forth. Uh, we wanted to pick a couple of large airports so that we could do that. Assuming it goes well, uh, then we'll field that uh, nationwide uh, before the end of the calendar year. And that will give us then recurrent uh, vetting of um, the same population against the criminal databases. So I'm, I'm comfortable that we're doing everything we can given, what, given the existing data that, that's out there. Uh, to ensure that these uh, workers are being vetted properly. The next step, of course, is to, is to then verify the trust of that population because we know that people that vet out okay can still, can still go bad uh, or can still have uh, criminal intent. So you, you always want to find ways to deter uh, people from acting uh, in, in ways that you don't want, to detect them and to disrupt if it does happen. So we're, uh, we're also in, the, in concurrently working um, with every, I'm, I'm, I, requ I required a vulnerability assessment at every single airport that's, that's, that's under federal um, control across the nation. So that's some 450 plus airports, uh, or some, uh, yeah, close to, close to the total population. There are some airports that don't require a federal um, security plan. But the idea behind this is to, is to get a true, very detailed vulnerability assessment of every single airport, understanding what's the worker pop population at that airport, what are the accesses that those workers have available to them? Who, what, what is the nature of the access that they have? I mean, they're driving cars through there. Are they bringing carts through? Are they carrying um, maintenance equipment? Uh, who are the various employers that employ these individuals? And how are they conducting their individual checks uh, and their recurrent checks as well? What are they doing to employ these individuals? I felt that there just wasn't enough data to understand what's actually happening out there. So that's a, a, um, an order I put out uh, is to provide a classified report to Congress on what we find. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Administrator Neffinger, uh, in your opening uh, statement, you talked about efficiency versus security uh, issues. Um, we all that want the prime function um, of the TSA is to prevent dangerous passengers and cargo from threatening air travel. While at the same time, the traveling public gets understandably frustrated by long wait times at the screening checkpoint. While safety is the highest priority, convenience is also a factor in, in the equation. The OIG report highlighted security vulnerabilities, but it also shined a light on a culture at TSA that was too willing to tolerate some of those vulnerabilities in the interest of managing wait times. Aside from the particular personnel, process, and technological changes that you've implemented, what has been done to address the underlying cultural problem of tolerating vulnerabilities? Well, there, there, there are a number of things, and, and some of it is the training that I mentioned. So the very first thing that we did, once we, once we completed the initial root cause analysis. We said, what, what's driving all this? And, and, we said, and we saw this big category of disproportionate focus on efficiency. I said, well, how does that happen? And where, where, did, where did that come from? And, and what's the nature of it? Uh, so there, there are actually a couple pieces to that, too. It was also that, that we hadn't, so, so there's a lot of pressure on the TSO, the, the front line, the, the uniformed member, to, to be the person managing the wait time. I mean, I think it's appropriate to pay attention to wait time. That's a, that's a challenge in and of itself. You don't want a lot of people congregating outside the secure area of the airport. Uh, but I, f I felt that that comes up the management chain a little bit. We put a lot of pressure on people that should be focused on, on stopping things that shouldn't get through uh, into managing. And, and so that creates a real tension in the individual and a little bit of cynicism, to be honest. They say, what's my real job here? Am I just flushing people through the line, or am I actually supposed to do my security? So that was one thing. Too much pressure at that very point of the mission uh, to be the one responsible for that. So we took that off immediately and said, your job is not to do, not to manage wait time. Your job is to ensure that, that things that shouldn't get through the checkpoint don't get through. And that's what I meant by focus on mission. And, uh, and we, got, we got a resounding a positive response to that from across the workforce. Uh, a lot of people said, thank you for letting us focus on the mission. Then you have to determine how to do that mission. So we did a rolling stand down uh, of training across the entire organization. We called it mission essentials training. Um, but it, what it really was was to take what happened, I wanted the first piece, what happened. Second piece was 
what are the processes that we found that didn't work very well? It turns out we had these very complicated standard operating procedures. I mean, it's a huge document, Nothing, something that, that would be very challenging to, re to remember. We simplified that. We, we worked with a team of frontline people to simplify that and turn it into a true simplified operating procedures. What am I trying to accomplish? What are the, me what are the key steps for doing that and moving forward? And then we looked at the machines themselves and said, you, know, you have to understand how this equipment operates. Uh, I was surprised to find out that many of our frontline officers didn't know what the limitations of the technology were that they were operating. And so we made it clear to them what that technology was. And then we closed it all up with a, with a, with a current threat brief. We are now doing that mission essentials training across the whole system of our technology for our officers every quarter. And we pick another aspect of the, of the screening environment. And we, do a, and we do regular threat briefs to them as well. I wanted to connect them to the mission, have them doing the right part of the mission and not things that they shouldn't be doing, get leadership back involved in the pieces that leadership needs to be involved with, more engaged with the airlines, with the airports, with the uh, more engaged on, on managing the, the, the flow of people through. So, so distribute that work in the right way possible. So I'm, I, I'm very happy about the, the response uh, by the frontline workforce. I mean, they've really, uh, I appreciate your comments earlier about their attitude. I think some of that is we're allowing them to do the job that they took the oath of office to do now, and they're very excited about that. They really want to do this job well. Uh, so I'm, I, th I think we're on a pretty good track. Uh, there's more to do, uh, clearly. And, and do you feel confident that these changes are being institutionalized so that? You know, it's, it's still early. Uh, we're, we're, we're only eight months into it, but, um, but, but I, I, I push this every single day. Uh, I have measures. I, I track measures res directly related to the things I just talked about. I, I have a performance measure and a readiness measure for people and for equipment. And the, the, the readiness measure says, are we, are we giving people the tools they need to do what they need to do? Am I training them properly? Uh, there's, 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 uh, there's interactive piece, there's a survey piece, there's an engagement piece to that. I'm happy to share with the committee how I measure That's that. Okay. I, think, I think it'd be useful. And then the performance measure is, and can they do what, the, what is the training work? Does it, make it, does it make it possible for them to do their job? So I do that, which means, and what I found, if, 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 the, if the guy at the top pays attention to something, almost everybody below you starts paying attention to it as well, which has been very helpful. Have you gotten any feedback from the OIG on, on some of these changes? We've, I've been working made? very closely with them, and I've had a number of meetings with um, Inspector General Roth. Uh, I think they're very happy with where we're going. Uh, they've, we provided the same uh, report that we provided to Congress, we were provided to the IG. Uh, they have, uh, they've concurred with every step that we're taking. Uh, he's told me that it addresses every one of their concerns. Their, their recommendations remain open because we, we have to verify, and they'll stay open as they go back and test us. But, but he's, he's told me that he's, he's happy with where we're going, he's comfortable with our approach, and, um, and, we have, and I have linked us up at, at all the staff levels uh, because I felt that there was uh, too much distance between us and the IG and the work that he was doing. And do you feel satisfied that the, your FY uh, budget request would give you the resources that you need to continue to prioritize both security and minimizing wait times? Well, I think it's, I, I, you know, the, the, I think the, it's an open question whether the resources are right yet. I, I, what I wanted to do was, was just hold steady. Uh, because I knew that, that there would be more to, to learn as we looked at, as, first of all, as we moved more people back into standard screening, as we try to expand the pre-check population, a true vetted population, uh, to a level that, that is more sustainable, over that, that allows us to do a better job of the risk-based security. And as I watch what happens in the growth of the passenger industry, I mean, we've had, we've had record growth over the past couple of years, uh, beyond what was anticipated when this budget was prepared a couple of years ago. So, so I'm pleased that the committee has allowed me to keep uh, that staffing. I think I, think I owe you a, a, an answer on that. And we're looking, I'm, I've got staff right now looking at now the current projections for volume growth, what we think we'll get into the trusted traveler population over the course of the next year and, and beyond. And, and what we see is the current pressure on the checkpoint. Uh, in the meantime, we're working very closely with, uh, I mean, specifically with the top 20 airports, but across the entire system uh, to work with the airports, the airlines that service those airports, as well as TSA to look to mitigate to the extent possible. So I'm gonna husband my uh, overtime resources now. I'm gonna push those into the summer months. Uh, we, we hope that we have what we need to address it, but my, my concern is that we may not have the staffing levels right yet. My time up? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Dr. Harris. 
Thank you very much, and thank you, Admiral, for uh, taking the job. And, and you know, I've noticed, I, I think it's gotten better, noticeably better at the airports, uh, so you must be doing a good job. <laughs> I hope so. Let me, I've got two areas of question. first one has to do with the, with the pre-check. Um, from the sound of your last answer, it sounds like we are actually a little bit safer, I'll use the term, the more people we get into CSA pre-check. Is that a fair assessment? I mean, is it a safety as well as convenience measure to uh, have trusted travelers? Well, I think first and foremost, the more you know about travelers that are traveling, the, the, the more comfortable I am uh, with, with the safety and the security of the system. So uh, I, I said in a, a previous testimony before Congress that I thought the goal would be a fully vetted traveler population if you could get there. That's probably unachievable, but I'd like to, I'd like to drive towards more and more people in the vetted. And the cost, and, and so let me, the cost per traveler to get them through the screening process, I imagine, is actually lower with the TSA pre-check person. It is because there, there's less that you have to do sure. to somebody coming through pre-check. But one of the obstacles, and maybe it's not, I don't know if you've studied it, I mean, there st is still a charge associated with becoming a trusted traveler. It's like, you know, we, we, we want you to help us screen you, but we want you to, you know, but r write a check first or, or give us a mm -hmm. credit card. Is there any thought into saying, look, long term, we actually, would it save money to actually reduce the fee, eliminate the fee, just encourage people en masse to get into the, to get into the pre-check program? Is this well, something that's been considered? Well, the cost is designed, uh, so TSA doesn't, doesn't benefit from, from the cost. It, it, it defrays the cost of the enrollment. Uh, so it pays the private contractor that does the enrollment services, and it and it's a reimbursement for the cost of doing the vetting uh, against the. Because right. we have to, we have, my have to pay that. But, no, I understand right. that. Um, I, you know, I think that um, th there's a cost associated with the with what you have to do to determine the trust of the trusted pa traveler. So, so so that cost has to come out of somewhere. I do think it's appropriate to have people contribute to the cost of the of a program that they that they're asking to be vetted for. Uh, it gives them access to um, these expedited screening lanes. Uh, I hope that. But, but as you get better in your non-TSA lanes, you know, <laughs> you reduce that incentive. And, and so, you know, th there seems to be. No, a I, I hear what you're saying. What, what I, here's what I would say is, is I think that over time you can see the enrollment cost come down. Or the, or the, and, and that's what we're hoping to see with the recent request for proposal that we put out, which would expand the opportunity for private sector enrollment centers to participate. So this would, this would open it up to a couple of other uh, opportunities. And I think if you can do that, you create some competition and, and we can see the price come down. Plus we can, you know, the more people you have, uh, the, the, the more that there is a um, economy of scale as sure. you start doing and these which, betting. Which we would gain from exactly. budgetary wise. Now let me just bring up one, uh, one other issue, which, which is, uh, you know, a particular concern to some, and that is, and. Uh, you know, you, you've got a business degree, so you, you get accounting and, and how you can mm, do things in accounting. And one of the things is this $908 uh, million dollars that you depend upon in new revenues in order to trans uh, take some other money from elsewhere and, and do something else with it. I mean, it goes somewhere else in the budget. Knowing that the $908 million, I mean, this committee, I don't think the administration wants this committee in, in to, in to open up that can of worms into, into being able to do things outside the appropriations pro normal appropriations process. So you've got kind of a budget gimmick. I mean, I, I'll just use the simplest word I can. And this isn't, you're not the only person uh, or the only group that's got a little budget gimmick here. I sit on the health subcommittee. Uh, there's over a billion dollar budget gimmick that would, uh, re will reduce the NIH appropriation, basically. Because in, in an election year, especially with this, and if you don't believe me, ask our former governor, uh, you don't want to be raising taxes and fees in an election year. You, I, I believe you don't want to do it any time. But in an election year, you're certainly not going to get it. I can't imagine the administration really thought Congress was going to say, you know what, let me fall on my sword and raise taxes and fees in an election year. That leaves us in a quandary because we have to actually write a budget no, without that $908 million. So that, that's, uh, that's a big chunk of your budget. So where are we going to cut $900 million to allow what we have control over to be in balance? Well, that, it, I mean, do you have a list of priorities? You know, if the gimmick doesn't work, uh, <laughs> help us out. W w what are we going to cut? I'll be honest with you. That would be a challenge for me to absorb a $900 million reduction in, 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 in this budget request. That represents... Uh, in terms of people, about 13,000 um, transportation security officers. Uh, I, I think if I were to reduce that level of, of uh, frontline workforce, uh, 
we'd have more than wait times as a, as a, as a challenge for us going forward. Uh, and there are some, uh, there would, it would be challenging to find, given that two-thirds of my budget is, is uh, pay compensation and benefits, uh, it would be challenging to find that amount of money anywhere else in the budget uh, so without eliminating entire programs. Begs the question, why do that? Why, no, you know, we all know the outcome of this is going to be that there's going to be no fee and tax raised. I mean, you know, it, it was tried before. Fortunately, last fiscal year it was given up on. Why, why do that? You know, you seem to be like an honest guy. Come on. Why, why bring that to the committee and uh, why not just on, honest budgeting? You know, come in, but don't, don't uh, depend upon those kind of fees. You, put, you understand how difficult that decision would be for you. It's going to be equally difficult for us to do it. Well, I, I think the argument is that, that people who benefit from the security services, directly benefit from security services provided, um, should contribute. And, and they do now. Uh, so we have a 550 per, per passenger fee per, per trip with a cap of a round trip, you know, double that per round raised, trip. Which we just raised, right? Uh, it was raised uh, a couple of years ago, yes. Uh, I, I think uh, it wasn't a couple. I think it was last year, wasn't it? 20, we went to the per was, trip where we, where, where it got, it was where, where, we, where, where, where it's now per, you know, it used to be per segment, now we kind of raised per, it was pretty recent. So is this a pattern I'm, I'm seeing develop that, you know, every year you come back and say, let's just go ahead and, because you did create last year's budget without that. That's what right. changed between last year and this year? But you have a much more complex threat environment this year than uh, we've had in, in, in a long time. And uh, your, let me just interrupt. Your total budget request isn't $900 million higher, right? Your total budget uh, request 146. is, uh, right, so it's not 900 So give me the big reason. That's a little reason. Give me the big reason why you, went, why, why you did this. It's uh, $900 million you're talking about. I, I think it would the uh, this re this would reinstate the um, airline security fee that was in place until the budget amendment of 2013. Uh, that actually went out uh, in 2014. It would reinstate that fee of 420 million dollars across oh, the industry. Oh, I get it. And it would I get where it's it would, from. And it would it's, add a dollar right. it's uh, to a the fee passenger increase. fee. 900 million dollars. I, I think the only the only answer I can give you is that the uh, it's um, I think the uh, as I say the argument is that people who directly benefit. Uh, should contribute to uh, the cost of the services. And you don't think the average the American benefits from our planes being secure in the sky? Absolutely. Okay, uh, so, I, I so there yeah. actually is a direct benefit to all Americans. I will just right. say, look, I, here I'm disappointed because we're messing with national security. And I would hope that there's some areas of the budget where we don't play games. For heaven's sake, the security of our transportation is so someplace we just shouldn't, uh, just my humble advice, we shouldn't be playing budgetary games. I yield back. Mr. Guayar. Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, so much. Uh, Mr. Administrator, again, uh, thank you for, uh, for the job that you're doing. Uh, and again, I appreciate um, the work that your folks do. Uh, I know through every week that I fly through Laredo, San Antonio, uh, your folks have been very, uh, very pleasant in doing their job. Uh, I want to ask you, go back to the question about the security gaps. Um, the IG, uh, that the IG found. At this point, I think you're requesting about $200 million for screening technology, $116 million for training frontline employees. Now, how are we going to be assured that we're not adding money and then we get the same results? Um, because it's not the first time we face this type of situation. If you remember, remember those X-ray machines that would show the body, and and then you all put them in a in a uh, somewhere you all were renting warehouses. We lost millions of dollars on those machines. We were paying millions of dollars for storage on that, and I I assume you all got rid of them already uh, to oh, the no. prisons or somewhere else where they expect less privacy. Um, so how do we make sure that we keep adding money for personnel, that we're adding money for technology, and we're not ending up with the same type of results? And I want to be very supportive, because you know, we all fly planes, uh, and I want to make sure that if we get into the plane that we're secure. But you know, when those red teams saw that it was only a success rate of 4%, that puts us to think about uh, some of the work that's being done. Well, you know, those are all the same questions that I asked when I came on board. Uh, there, there, there was a benefit to coming 
uh, to taking the job in the midst of a crisis. It allows you to ask questions that, that you might not otherwise be able to ask and allows you to, to address things in a way uh, that uh, you might not normally be able to do. So here's what I can tell you, and, and, and we owe you continuous updates, and I think I've, I've provided uh, I think I provided a 120-day report to you, and I will continue to do that on a quarterly basis, uh, partly to give you the measures that we're using to determine whether or not anything that you're paying for is actually, and that the American public is paying well, for. What's your paying. number one, uh, are your measures, excuse me for interrupting, but are your measures on uh, performance.gov? Uh, I don't know if we post, well, we probably won't post, some of these are sensitive uh, information, so I'm, I, I, I prefer not to post actual performance. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to give that to the committee, uh, but most of it is, is uh, sensitive information. Yeah. But what I, I, I measure, as I men mentioned, readiness, and then I measure performance, and I do that for both people and equipment. That's the, the big roll-up measure. There's a lot of components And we're measuring results, not activity. Because agents, agencies have a tendency, and I've seen the uh, uh, performance.gov, uh, and, and a lot of those measures there, and they're getting better, and, and I'm talking about you, but Homeline in general, uh, the measures that I've seen have been more for activity than measuring yeah, results. No, this is out, these are outcome measures. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm very focused on, on how well are we doing our mission. Uh, in my opinion, we weren't focused on outcome measures. So it's easy to measure activity. You're busy every day, right. uh, that may, but you may not be busy doing the right things. Right. So, so I'm very interested in understanding whether we're actually improving. Uh, so that's my fundamental focus right now, and that's one of the things I've been working with the IG is to, is to ensure that, that that what his tests help us understand our outcomes in addition to ours. So we've, we've, we've completely changed the way we do our red team testing so that it's focused on, on outcomes and then rolling those outcomes back into uh, the way we do business. The, that, the difference here, here's what I said, here's the way I approached it uh, and, and, and what I think we need to continue to do going forward. You always have to look at the systemic issues. You don't get that unless you figure out whether you got the, the thing that you needed to get on the other end. The other piece of this, and this is the piece that, uh, that is sometimes, I, I don't think, is, as well understood by, the, by an agency, you can't just focus on the operating end of the agency. You have to look at all the things that support operations. So as you, as you set, you know, when, when, when the American public says, I want you to get something, to do something, in, their, in our case, to secure the aviation system, then you have to figure out, well, how do I get to secure? Well, there's, there, there are things you have to buy, there's capability you need, there's requirements that you need. So I asked, I wasn't sure that we were doing that very well. And so I asked the um, uh, Defense Acquisition University to come in and, and do a, a top to bottom review of the way we analyze our mission, set the requirements for the mission, and then eventually field capability, either people or things, uh, to do it. And not surprised, they just completed that uh, um, study for me. And not surprisingly, they found things that we need to do better. So I think there's a lot of work we need to do on the requirements end of the business so that we actually know what we need to do to get the outcome we want. That will keep you from putting things in warehouses. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a fan of buying the next shiny object on the shelf. I'd like to buy the, the object that actually does the thing and it integrates into a system and it's designed to produce a result at the end of the day. I got a, another appropriation as you know, we're running around, uh, so I won't be able to come back and again, with all due respect. Uh, thank you again, but um, for your personnel, I know there are some of your folks who are uh, part-timers. Uh, are, are you planning to move any of them up to full-time? And then uh, TSA officers, maybe somebody asked this question, uh, plan to move any of them to the GS pay scale? And, and that's all the questions I have. Okay, well, on the, on the uh, part-time, full-time, we, we actually have a, a sizable full-time staff, but, but almost everybody hires in part-time and then converts to full-time. I'd, like uh, I'd like to see whether we can work with the committee to find ways to hire more full-time on the front end so that they don't have to wait to go, to go full-time. Uh, and then with respect to the uh, GS schedule, as you know, the, I'm not currently under the, um, the general schedule, uh, and, and that's a function of the Aviation uh, uh, Transportation Security Act. Uh, it would take a, it would take a congressional, a congressional act for, to do that if we were to do that. Okay. Thank you again for, for the you, work Mr. you're Blair. doing. TSA has had trouble hiring and training teams to, to the enacted level. As you and I have discussed, canines are an extremely effective asset. I think TSA can do a better job 
of 11 degrees from Florida. TSA's budget request includes an increase of 9.7 million of FY16 to fund 997 K9 teams. How many teams does TSA currently have deployed? What is TSA doing to aggressively hire and train K9 teams to reach an active level? And how many more K9 teams does TSA need to support its operations? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I like canines, too, and uh, I think it's probably one of the most effective elements of the security program, and it also allows us to move people very efficiently through the system. So I think I've got a good story to tell on canines. We, um, we have uh, uh, 997 teams currently, and uh, we are uh, 322 of those are directly operated by TSA. As you know, we also provide teams to uh, state and local law enforcement, uh, uh, but we train for them. Uh, so we now have 322 teams. Of those, 142 are, are trained, in addition to being cargo sniffing dogs, are trained as passenger sniffing dogs. The goal is to train all 322 in both so that you can move them between cargo and passengers. And as you know, there's, there's, it's two different modes of training. Uh, the cargo, if they're sniffing cargo, it's a, it's a, they walk up to an item and they sniff it. Uh, the passenger, it's, they're moving within a passenger environment and they're, they're, they're detecting the vapor. Uh, that's moving, and then they tr trace it back to its source, it, it, which is fascinating to watch when, when, when they do it, both in the test and in the real environment. Uh, so the goal is to train. We'll get about 230 of those done by the end of this year. Uh, we can move about 230 teams a year through our new training center down in um, uh, San Antonio. In fact, I'll be in San Antonio tomorrow uh, to take a look at the new uh, training facility that we've conducted there. Uh, we've just completed contracts for, uh, 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 with breeders to get dogs. So right now, we're not, seeing, we're not having a problem getting dogs and we're not having a problem with the throughput. Uh, there's a, there's a, still a fairly high attrition rate for dogs, about 13% annually. Uh, these are dogs that either become medically unfit during training or, or for some reason fail the, the training. Uh, but that's apparently standard around the world uh, at that level. But, so that means about 260 dogs start, about 230 come out the other end. Uh, I think we can use more teams. Uh, I owe you a good number on that. I don't want to just make one up. Uh, but I think that we can put more teams to use uh, it, it's of great value, particularly in the top 20 uh, busiest airports, you know, that, that account for about 85% of the traveling population. Uh, so, uh, so we'll we'll get you a full report on what we're doing, but I think it's a good it's a good story. Well, you know, I think we owe you a report at the end of this month uh, on that on that that very question. But uh, the, the 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 there's a couple components to that. Uh, can they can they construct a facility that can meet the standards for the training? And then and then what's the uh, what's the re how do we continue to uh, ensure they meet that? I think those are the easy questions to an to answer. I, uh, the 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 harder question is integrating them into the checkpoint environment. What's the are there any authorities needed to do that? Uh, we'd have to talk to you about that. We'll take a look at that. So those are the questions that we're asking. Our goal is to come to you with, with an outline of what we think the, the, the questions would be, the concerns, and then the availability of, of the teams out there. So I'd want to make sure it was done consistently uh, to the right standards. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with the work that's being done now to train canines, and, and we've got a, uh, it's a it's, it's actually a very good program, and people are, uh, the local, state and local law enforcement that are using the dogs are very happy with the program. Good. Ms. Robel Allard? Uh, the, uh, the FY16 House report highlighted the problem with current pre-clearance locations in which baggage transfer to connecting domestic flights in the U.S. has to be rescreened. And I understand that TSA has made some progress uh, on this problem. Can you give us uh, an update and talk a bit more about how TSA verifies the baggage screening operations at the checkpoint and pre-clearance airports? Um, uh, are they equivalent to TSA standards? Yes, ma'am. So I'll start with the last point. They, they do have to meet TSA standards, and they have to be equivalent in, in terms of their ability to detect um, explosives and, uh, and other contraband that shouldn't get through. Uh, there are 15 preclearance airports right now. Uh, five now. There are 15 uh, preclearance airports. And as you know, that's a, it's a program managed by CBP, but we work very closely because there's a TSA, strong TSA component to that. Uh, in order to meet preclearance uh, requirements, they also have to have 
a, a TSA equivalent uh, screening, and uh, so equivalent to what we do domestically, both for passengers and checked baggage. The, um, the, uh, of those 15, there are five airports now that have uh, agreements with us uh, that we've agreed, uh, that have agreed that, that um, uh, meet the, the baggage screening requirements, so there's no need to rescreen when they come here. Uh, so we're very pleased about that. We're, trying, we're hoping to expand that over the course of, uh, of the coming months. The, um, the way in which we verify that they meet our standards is through uh, annual inspections. Uh, well, there's the initial installation, so they have to, uh, they have to uh, I uh, identify and, um, and demonstrate that they, that they meet our standards, and we verify that. Uh, and then we do uh, periodic, um, uh, at least annual, or whenever we make a change to the, to the system requirements uh, to inspect them. Uh, a lot of that's done by our, by our teams that are present in, in countries around the world uh, to do that. So I'm, I think it's a good program. It, uh, it, it is, it's part of the, part of the No Hassle Flying Act was to address this, and we're systematically walking through it. Uh, some countries are having a little more challenge in, 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 in meeting the baggage screening standards. They, they obviously hit the passenger screening challenge. And I don't mean challenge in that they don't have, uh, they don't do a good job. It's just that it has to, uh, it has to have the explosive detection system uh, as part of it. What happens if you find that they don't meet the standards? If they don't meet the standards, then, uh, then depending upon the severity of not meeting it, sometimes it's just a correction. Uh, but ultimately, uh, I suppose you could uh, wind up losing your preclearance status if, uh, if you couldn't maintain the standard. Um, we usually talk about airport security in terms of protecting the sterile areas of, of airports, but the non-sterile areas prior to the checkpoint are also vulnerable. Uh, my hometown airport, LAX, has experienced its share of security mm -hmm. incidents, including the tragic shooting death of TSO uh, Gerardo Hernandez in late 2013. And following that incident, TSA made a number of changes to security policies and procedures, including new recommended standards for law enforcement presence outside the checkpoint and requirements for response times. Are airports generally following the recommended standards for presence and the requirements for the response times? They are. That was a, that was a, a, a tragic wake-up call uh, across the whole system. I mean, it didn't, it, it sort of directly affected LAX, of course, but, it, but it, was, it was felt across the system, and not just by TSA, by, by other law enforcement agencies. Uh, I actually uh, watched the, the video of that and, um, and sat down with um, um, Chief Pat Gannon of the uh, LAX uh, uh, Police Department, and, um, and, uh, and we talked through that. So here's what we've done. Uh, we have a very strong active shooter program now in place. So we do annual training and, and, semi and, and twice yearly drills. And we do that not just by ourselves, but in conjunction with the law enforcement uh, and, and airport partners. Uh, we do, um, uh, and then there is periodic um, uh, retraining uh, throughout the year uh, that the um, individual uh, officers go through. And so there's a constant drills. We've installed duress alarms uh, across the entire system at every checkpoint, at every point in every checkpoint. So those dress alarms tie directly to the local law enforcement for response, and they drill those dress alarms for response time and, um, and, and actions. Uh, I can tell you that just, uh, if you recall last year, we had the incident in New Orleans where the individual with the machete and the wasp spray attempted to uh, attack a checkpoint. Uh, the people at that checkpoint, uh, both our officers as well as the, the uh, Jefferson County Sheriff's deputy who, who was the one who uh, wound up um, um, stopping the individual, said it was a direct result of that training that we instituted that they knew what to do. And it, when you watch that video, you can see people doing exactly what they should be doing. So I think that uh, that's one, it's one data point, but I think it's an example of why it's so important that you train and that you drill and that you continue to work it. Uh, this, is a, this is a focus of mine. I've, I've, I'm, I'm always concerned about the safety of our officers um, who, are, who are outside the sterile area of the airport uh, because we know that there are people in this world who, will, um, who are unpredictable and will do things that they shouldn't. My five minutes. <coughs> Dr. Harris, no more questions? Well, let me ask a couple of more. TSA <laughs> PreCheck Private Sector Expansion. TSA has often cited a goal of enrolling 25 million people in DHS Trusted Traveler Program to more effective and effectively and efficiently focus our, it, the resources on unknown or high-risk travelers. It has an initiative underway with the private sector to expand TSA pre-check enrollment. 
When do you expect pre-check enrollment will be available to the public through these private sector vendors? What other efforts are you using to expand enrollment? And in your statement, uh, you indicate TSA is aiming to reach the goal of 25 million enrollments within the next three years. How realistic is the timeline, this timeline, and what are the resources implications for achieving that goal? Well, I think it's in, in talking with the private sector uh, folks who are who had indicated or did respond to our RFP, uh, they tell me that they think it's very reasonable that we could achieve that goal within three years once they go active. So I'm hoping by the end of this calendar year, uh, we will have um, uh, let contracts uh, to, to additional private sector vendors to provide enrollment services and to do so in a more retail environment. Uh, that will include, you know, as you know, part of the request for proposal was to, was to determine whether or not, uh, or was, was to ask them for uh, response to the requirement to market it more effectively as well. Uh, you know, it, as it turns out, advertising is actually pretty important if you want people to, to, to pay attention. Uh, in the meantime, we're, we've worked with the existing vendor uh, both to increase the uh, availability at, at airports and we've worked with, I've talked with the uh, airlines and travel associations, airline associations and if, the, if, if you've noticed uh, recently on flights, uh, many of the airlines are actually marketing pre-check on either on their in-flight um, uh, notices or in their in-flight magazines. Uh, if you go to some airlines websites, it pops right up to see if you want to join pre-check. All of that has actually been um, uh, helpful in dramatically increasing enrollment. So we're seeing already, uh, just with the existing vendor, a doubling of enrollment, daily enrollments uh, since uh, over this time last year. So we were averaging a little over 3,000 enrollments a day last year. We're up around 6,200 enrollments a day this year. So that's, that's huge. We've grown the, so the pre-check population has grown to about 2 million right now. That's on top of about, um, six and a half million people in the other trusted travel programs. Uh, so I'm hopeful that we can see a dramatic growth, but it will depend upon uh, issuing these contracts to the private sector uh, partners and then, and then them getting to work. Uh, you expect those contacts to be let this? I hope by the end of the, by the, by the, I hope by the end of this calendar year, of calendar year 16, but we're evaluating those bids now and, uh, and what I'll, I'll, I'll have a better feel for that as we, as we do the bid evaluation. Ms. Obelai, would you have any more? Yeah, I, I do have one more question. Follow up on the, on the pre, pre um, uh, the pre check. Because uh, even though there has been some increase uh, in, uh, on the pre check, it's my understanding that the largest portion of the traveling population that receive expedited screening are those assessed to be the low risk, uh, to be low risk using the secure flight uh, risk assessment. And last year, TSA discontinued the use of managed inclusion too because the risk assessment on which it was being based was determined to be inadequate. So how confident should we be that expedited screening is appropriate for travelers based on secure flight assessment? And isn't the kind of vetting that is associated with pre-check programs and CBP vetting programs what we actually should be relying on? Well, I, I, I would like to see a fully vetted population, uh, but I, I am confident that, first of all, we had to turn off managed inclusion, too. I, I, I don't think that that was supportable, and plus I think it introduced a, a higher level of risk into the system than, 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 than we were willing to accept, and it was justifiable. Uh, what I'd like to do is, without going in publicly into the rules, I think I, think I owe you um, um, uh, an answer uh, offline about the uh, how the rules are determined. Uh, we have dramatically uh, shrunk that population. I'm I'm comfortable that what we're doing is is appropriate, and if I could show you that population, I think you'd you'd understand that. And uh, what I'd like to do is not talk publicly about those rules, uh, but it's a very small um, percentage compared to what it was before. And uh, but the goal is to move all of that into truly vetted population, and and what I'd like to do is transition to that fully vetted population as we provide more opportunities for people to enroll to sunset those other provisions and, uh, and make it, um, 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 like I said, a, a fully vetted population across the board. And, and then my final question is, is, do you see, foresee, you know, in the future a time when the vetted population would be so large that TSA would then start limiting the expedited screening? 
No, actually just the opposite. I think you could then, once you get, if you had a very large vetted population, then you can really begin to do true dynamic risk assessment of, of, of travelers. And so you can think about it. You could actually get to a point where you where you're confident enough in some travelers that they will uh, that they could actually move through in, with relatively little oversight and screening. Uh, whereas and then and then you graduate depending upon how much you know about somebody. So I think it's just the opposite. I think you actually get a much better approach to your risk-based security, uh, so that you're not just have a few categories of people now. Now you could have uh, a, a true continuum of risk. And, uh, and I can foresee a day when you could have travelers going through things like the known crew member lane where you've got, you know enough about the individual and, they've, and they provided you with enough confidence that, uh, that, they're, that they're safe to go through. Do I have a choice? <laughs> yeah, you can say no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was born ready. Uh, welcome. Nice to see you. In your testimony, you state that TSA is pursuing an intelligence-driven, risk-based approach to screening and identifying threats. You're trying to move more people into pre-check to provide more efficient screening for low-risk, frequent travelers. TSA is also developing the Dynamic Aviation Risk Management Solution, the DARMS, to integrate intelligence assessments and analytics into procedures. Yet, the most recent terror attack our nation has suffered, the San Bernardino shooting, was committed by terrorists previously unknown to law enforcement. At the same time, security lanes are routinely shut down for false alarms or screeners. Is this risk-based strategy TSA is pursuing leaving the door open for those who have gone undetected by our law enforcement and intelligence communities? And is there a substitute for thorough, hands-on, effective screening? Well, what I would say is I, I think we're doing a, a far better job of uh, catching things that shouldn't get through the checkpoint now than we were uh, even a year ago. Uh, and that goes to the work that we've done since the uh, IG report was leaked uh, publicly uh, to determine true root causes of those of those failures, and then to implement a change to that. Uh, but how do you measure that when you say I think we've done a far better? Oh, well, well you, you you have to test it. We okay. so we're going out and we're doing we're we're doing follow-on red team testing of our own uh, to determine uh, not just red team testing, but you test to see whether the procedures actually catch the things that you want to catch. So there's there's open testing. First of all, hey, am I if I do a pat down of a certain type? Uh, did I find the device that uh, that we're that we're that we're hiding there? And we do that openly just to see if, if you find it. And you also do uh, your own covert testing uh, through the system, and we've done a lot of that. So I'm what I, what I'm finding is that we are significantly better at that. Uh, so our 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 own results tell us we're better. Now that'll be borne out by as others independent of us do that testing, and the IG's got a series of tests scheduled uh, over the coming months and and over the course of this next year, and uh, and I've worked very closely with him to ensure that. Um, uh, that we that we work collectively on on correcting these problems. So that's the first thing is you had to get better at that primary mission. So we really really focused our folks back on the mission and took took all the other stresses off them. You know I don't I don't want uh, transportation security officers managing wait times. I want them I want them focused on their mission. Uh, and if their mission is to read an X-ray, I want them to read that X-ray and pay attention to it. So that's the first thing we've done. The second thing is, with respect to uh, the population, uh, there's always going to be the potential that you have uh, an unknown who, who suddenly becomes um, uh, a problem. The, but there are things you can do, even given that, to, to identify problems that might be arriving. So, th so remember, you put your name into a system when you, when you make a travel reservation. Uh, that gets vetted against databases. Now, if it comes up negative, uh, you might say, well, how would I know that this person is, is not what they're supposed to be? But you have all of these, you have, you have vo these virtual elements of a place where he was known and he had worked and, um, and, and didn't have any security standards in the, in the way be between him and the they're working to achieve. Yes, sir. Well, the, the, the funding is specifically to allow us to begin hiring. Uh, we haven't hired any new federal air marshals since 2011. And so that's a challenge for any um, operating agency. You have to, you have to replace uh, at some point uh, the attrition and create, a, create an entry path. The average age of the uh, federal air marshals now is 43. Uh, we, will, we will age out man a mandatory retirement about close to 30 percent of that workforce over the next five years. So, so to, just to sustain the workforce. So what this will allow us to do is to hire back to attrition uh, for the first time since 2011. Uh, I think it's, really, it's critically important, first of all, to have um, a law enforcement capability in an agency tasked with the security of this nation's transportation system. Uh, that's 
first and foremost. And there are, there are things that air marshals do uh, that I think are, are, are important in that respect. Uh, there is still, in my opinion, uh, a mission for the air marshals uh, on flights. Uh, I would, what I'd like to do is provide the committee with a classified report which can show uh, some of the, some of the reason behind that statement, uh, what, what the, the types and the nature of flights that, they're, that we're putting them on. That said, Director Rod Allison, who has been in place for about a year and a half now, uh, has done a, uh, what I think a, a superb job of identifying what the true need is, establishing a, a strategic uh, con ops for the or con concept of operations for the air marshals, uh, addressing what, what specifically they do to fit into the transportation security network, and as well as what the real reason is to have them on certain flights of certain, of certain types. Well, I'll take you up on that classified briefing, and I appreciate you being here today, and I appreciate uh, my chairman and my ranking member, Lucille Roy Allard. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I, too, would like to have a classified yes, briefing. Yes, sir. I have a question. This price tag is $815 million. Yeah, and, and, and if you'd like, Mr. Chairman, we can do it for the committee and, and just come uh, give you a classified brief on... on Yes, sir. Well, and one of the other things I wanted to do was to have a was to have a defined number, and uh, you know we've never publicized a number, but we've also never developed a number, and so I so I I said we got to develop a number. What do we need? So I think we have that now, and uh, and I think we have a, a good strategy. Uh, that we'd like to present to you, and I think we can show you why we think that strategy makes sense. You know, the where's Waldo? <laughs> well, when, when my wife flies with me, she puts me to the I think, unless you have something? No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, we Mr. Chairman. All here. right. Yes, sir. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Webb-Allard. Thank you.